Let's recite Fatiha for all those who have left this world, including our brother who recently drowned, Brother Marhum Rabih, and all those who have left this world, and the mother of our Hajj, Samir Jafar. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آله التيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أستق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله يأمركم أن تؤدوا الأمانات إلى أهلها وإذا حكمتم بين الناس أن تحكموا بالعدل إن الله نعم يعذهم به إن الله كان سميعا بصيرا صدق الله العلي العظيم سلوة على محمد وآل محمد All praise belongs to Allah سبحانه وتعالى and I begin in His blessed name for granting us this existence allowing us to exercise our limited free will as I mentioned yesterday and giving us the opportunity to fight our evil inclinations and I seek refuge with Allah from my own ignorance and arrogance, for that is what will destroy us. It is, we are the worst enemy to ourselves, and there's no greater enemy to us than ourselves. And we are our best friends, and there's no greater friend to us than ourselves. That's the reality of life. We may think it's our friends, it's our money, it's our society, it's our children, it's our families, whatever, whatever, None of those can damage us more than ourselves. So we seek refuge in that. And that Allah has granted us this limited free will by which when he says, Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu alaykum anfusakum. Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nar. O you believe, take care of yourselves. Take care of yourselves and your family from the pending punishment were you to be reckless and lethargic, and as one would say, challenging to the truth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted us this free will as an honor. Our existence is an honor, but greater honor is free will. And even greater honor is guidance. And even greater honor are the prophets and the imams and the Quran. Subhanallah. And of course, Allah has guided our souls that's huge as an honor. And Allah in the Quran says, if you simply focus on all my mercies, you will remain in the right path. For then you will understand the gravity of this examination and you will be naturally taken in the direction of being a good person. You will naturally love to give and forgive and to care and to share. So these conversations are all about what has Allah created us for? And why are we commemorating such a great event as in Karbala? We all know, it doesn't take a Muslim, doesn't take a follower of Ahlul Bayt to understand that when somebody sacrifices their selves, then they certainly love. For these two words, love and sacrifice, are inseparable. But the greater value in love is sacrifice. For we can say that I love you, or I love something, but if I don't sacrifice, then it is meaningless. But if I sacrifice, and I don't say I love, it is enough evidence that you love. For sacrifice is all-encompassing, just like mercy. Mercy is all-encompassing. It has justice in it. It has love in it, what we call rahmah. That is why you will notice the Quran the entire Quran, 114 chapters except one, starts with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful. For there is no word more powerful 
in the domain of the realities of the universe than Rahmah. That is why Allah says, Kataba ala nafsir Rahmah. Indeed, I have made incumbent upon myself, wajib upon myself, mercy. When you and I understand that, then we will become merciful. We will become givers. We will become protectors. We will become guides. We will become the true lovers of the creation of God, the way Allah intended us to love. When people ask, why do you believe in God? Say to them that I can understand science, I can understand a lot. But at the end of the day, what matters is that I need to be a good person. But we all know that good needs to go to infinity. One cannot say I will be good for a day, for a week, for a month, and only so much good. Thereafter, I stop. One must make every effort to be approaching what we call the infinite good. We are finite. Our deeds are finite. But if we do not aim towards the infinite good, whatever good we do is minimized. It's marginalized. That is the reason why we believe in God. When people ask us, why do you believe in God? Say to them, the ultimate, absolute good is God. For he created the universe. He shaped everything in it. And Allah talks about it constantly in the Quran. You see? Allah says, هَذَا خَلْقُ اللَّهِ مَاذَا خَلَقَ الَّذِينَ مِن دُونِي This is what God has created. Show us what anyone else has created. هَذَا خَلْقُ اللَّهِ مَاذَا خَلَقَ الَّذِينَ مِن دُونِي Show us. For there is nothing that one can show on that matter. So as a result, what we find within ourselves is that when we believe in Allah, we take for ourselves the ultimate good. We move in that direction. For Allah is the one who honors us with existence. He maintains our morality. He observes us. Don't you know that God sees? Allah in the Quran says, Wallahu basirun bima ta'amalun. Allah sees that which you do. Wallahu basirun. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. Saying, can you adjust this, please? There's a bit of a feedback, my apologies. Salwa ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. When we commemorate this event, what is the event of Karbala all about? It is all about morality, it is about justice. It is about uprightness. Look what Imam went through. He went through loss. Loss of his family, loss of his life, loss of, loss of his companions. He went through all those losses. So if you and I are achieving material gains, then the Imam should have achieved material gains. But he's telling us, on that day, nothing will help us except hearts that are tranquil. Allah says, Allah When you do dhikr of Allah, hearts become tranquil. When you do good, hearts become tranquil. When you avoid evil, hearts become tranquil. When you worship God, hearts become tra tranquil. When we forgive, hearts become tranquil. But if we're not willing to do so, then of course we will be depressed. If you look at statistics today, the human race is going towards greater depression and suicide. In the United States, since 2012 to 2018, in just a matter of six years, I want you to understand that in a matter of six years, this country has increased in suicide rates by 30%. Statistical fact. 30% more people have killed themselves in this past six years. That is becoming asymptotic, as one would say, meaning it's going to double and triple and quadruple. So homicides have gone down, suicides have gone up. We've become ultra-protective of ourselves. 
where we've denied ourselves social interactions at the human level. We're now indulging in cyber world, which is now leading us to become bipolar in many ways, because we have dual personalities now. We're living so much in that world that we've become two different people. That day to day, we cannot even converse. We cannot even give each other eye contact. I see children addicted. Is it because they love it? I think it's because we're not talking the real lingo with them. You and I as a human race, as adults, are not talking the real lingo. When people get together, try to listen in, in their conversation and see how many are talking about the purpose of life, the vision of life, what they need to do in a positive way. You will hear them bickering, gossiping, fault finding, and they're enjoying it to the brim. When children see that, it leads to apathy. Life has no purpose. It's so meaningless. While parents are busy talking or friends are busy talking about how to amass billions of dollars and how they cheated this one and took that land, children see, well, if that's the way life is, then what's the purpose? There is innate, what we call deep-rooted depression that starts. And we start to get very, very depressed. For life has no purpose. We lose the hope. We have no desire. So then we look for instant pleasure. When one of the instant pleasures is open up the refrigerator and take anything that's sweet. Feels good for the second. And you start feeding. You touch your mouth. The food is in your mouth. It relieves your tension a little bit. The next thing you know, you're out of shape. You're developing type 2 diabetes. And your body is now starting to degrade and die. And I'm talking about 13, 14, 15 year olds, not 80, 90 year olds. Just new teenagers starting to degrade. Socially, those even who are on the social media, they are famous, looking to become even more famous. Allah says, Al Hakum al Takathur, Hatta Zurtum al Maqabir. Abundance has diverted you. That you are such a famous person making millions of dollars, but you need to make more millions and more millions and become even more famous and get more likes and more followers because it's all about numbers. What happened to values? What happened that when we go to the graveyard and we bury human beings, do we ever look around and say, where's all his, you know, when usually when you travel, you have luggage. Where's your luggage? How many bags are you checking in? You're going to an eternal journey to the next world. Where's your baggage? Should we not be asking, like, are we digging another hole in the grave to put their gold and their silver and their money? Nobody ever asks that. Nobody. The only thing we take is our coffin, our shroud. Do we talk about that? No. In fact, we don't like to talk about it. We're scared. In fact, when somebody of our loved ones dies, we send them to the mortician who beautifies them and puts makeup on them to make them look like they're alive and sleeping. They put blush on their faces to make them look reddish. When they're pale. Yeah, so that I see them like they're sleeping. Because, you know, I don't want to have that image of them having left this world. So we are averse to seeing that. Then let's ask the question, what's the wisdom of God? That when we die, why is it that the body does, just does not disintegrate and vanish? Why does it have to be washed? And if we don't, it decomposes and gives off a foul smell. Oh, that's the loved one who used to smell good yesterday. Allah says, wajib kifai, go and take this body, wash it, give it its due right, dig the hole and bury it. Ya Allah, why don't you do it? It scares me. Allah says, this death is your wake-up call. For you have forgotten the value of life. You've been too busy plugging in the wrong directions, which is leading to apathy, which is leading to depression, which leads to alternative lifestyles, which leads our children to get into those indulgences. That today, drug abuse is so prevalent. The subtle forms even hidden under the garb of medicinal, quote-unquote. That marijuana today, weed, is hidden under the garb of medicine. When marijuana 
shrinks your brain. Tetrahydrocannabinol is known to reduce the surface area of your brain. It actually shrinks your brain, and there's a direct correlation to it leading to psychosis. Well, we are there. And then the criminals in their little laboratories are taking all the chemistry and mixing them up. Everybody's going to cloud six and seven? No, no, we'll take them to cloud nine. Nine is not working? Ten. Twelve. And their brains, their brains blow apart with the first whiff. And that drug comes in and just destroys your innards. I've seen teenagers die in a heartbeat, not wake up. Fentanyl. It's one of those very, very exotic drugs coming. You know, one carload of fentanyl is more lethal than all the nuclear weapons we have on Earth. But we don't care. There's a market. And if that's not enough, you know, fentanyl takes you to another level. Car fentanyl is even more. And there's a market out there. See, nobody in the lab will make it if there's no market. You don't make something where there's no market. There's a market, sisters and brothers. There's a market, my dear sisters and brothers, honestly, on this earth. And I'm worried about our next generations. How many of our children will fall into this trap, this abysmal trap, that parents are willing to give all their wealth to bring this child out of this dependency? That it is so sad that even in the professional industry sometimes, some physicians who are licensed are part of this game. That's how unethical this Machiavellian idea has become. That whatever it takes to prescribe to get rich, even at the cost of destroying the human race. Allah says, mankind, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ Indeed, we created man in the best of forms. Then we lowered them to the lowest of the law. What does it mean? It means Allah allowed us this recklessness so that when we are right, when we are on the battlefield fighting for justice, the way the companions of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, the way the women, Zainab alayhi salam, Umm Farwa, Layla, they were all standing there looking. Some say Layla was not there. Hmm? Rabab, the wife of Imam Hussain, the mother of Abdullah, the mother of Ruqayya, standing there watching, giving their lives giving their happiness, thirsty, starving, but standing firm. That's the morality Allah loves. Inna Allah shara min al anfusam. Allah has purchased them, given them a gift. Allah says that they not only anfusam, amwalahum, they even sell their wealth. For me, Allah says, upright. What does Allah mean by that? Allah doesn't want us to hold swords and go fight. He wants us to be upright, to be God conscious, to stay away from this danger, to learn, to read, to converse. That when we have gatherings, let's talk sensible talk, not rubbish talk. Then the fruits of our children come out in the wrong way and they become lost, sometimes, God forbid, criminals. We cheat each other all the time, we've lost it. Honestly, statistically, as I mentioned, even when I mentioned the other day, the beauty pageant is changing its pathways. It's coming back to this. Modesty to this. It's coming back because we are all guinea pigs with the social scientists, you see. And only in time we begin to realize, oops, we made a mistake. But here's the danger of moral mistakes. Sometimes it's irreversible. Because when you raise a child the wrong way at an early age, it takes a nation to bring them back sometimes. And it's irreversible sometimes. So we need to be cognizant and careful that even before the child is born, how is it going to be nurtured in the womb of the mother? What kind of food will it be fed? What kind of talk is the mother going to have when the baby is forming? Research shows that children are acutely aware, infants in the wombs of their mothers are acutely aware of their outer environment and they adopt 
Many, many pathways and behavioral sciences study, they show that there's a direct effect even before the child is born on how this child is nurtured in the womb of its mother. But we gossip, we fight, we indulge in smoking, weed, even shisha. I know some people don't like what I say. It's bad for us. I don't understand why we're even going there. Stop, please. It's deadly. It's not good. Even Marhum Sayyid Muhammad said, Fallallahu rahmatullahi alayhi, said it is forbidden for you to touch this stuff. How many people will follow great scholars like that who pass such rulings and say, this is enough, this is bad for you. You don't need to go there. What has Allah made haram for you? قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي أَخْرَجَ الْعِبَادِ وَالطَّيِّبَاتِ مِنَ الرِّزْقِ who made haram for you the good things? Go do the good things. Go to the gym. Eat good food. Eat healthy food. Live a healthy lifestyle. Grow old and be the best representative on earth. Why kill yourself? You make money with your fancy cars and then you park them outside these places where people are just smoking and your head is dizzy. This is the way of the Imam? You think Imam Sabu Zaman salam, would do this? You think Rasulullah salam, sallallahu alayhi wa will do this? I don't need to point a finger. I'm with you. I'm no better than you. I'm not higher than you, those of us. And I'm not condemning those who do. But let's advise. Tawasu bil haq. Wa tawasu bil sabr. Let's advise each other. Brother, please. Sister, please. Cut it. Stop it. Be healthy. We love what God has given you. Prolong it. Don't go to the hospital tomorrow. Don't be a burden on yourself. Eat the good stuff. Stay away from haram. Why do we do this? Oh, I'm stressed. This helps me. How about Quran? Oh, that's too much. Quran? Me? La. We cry for Imam Hussain alayhi salam. He was the walking, talking, living Quran. Quran and not the moving, living. Yeah, but that's Quran, you know. That's the excuse we give. We learn everything else. We learn the art of how to do real estate, how to do everything else. We're smart. But when it comes to learning what Allah says, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارَةٌ What we have revealed in the Quran is a shifa and a mercy for you, and it does nothing to the wrongdoers but destruction. We turn a blind eye. وَقَالَ رَسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذْ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَعْجُورًا the Prophet will say on Judgment Day, my community has ignored the gift of God. You and I are all going to psychiatrists, we're going to doctors, we're trying, going to community leaders. Help me, help me, help me, I'm depressed. When Allah is saying, I've already given you what you need for your help, but you're ignoring it, you're ignoring it. And yet you cry for Imam Hussain. Why do you think he was there? If not to save our salah, if not to save our deen, if not to teach us good morals, if not to teach us being upright, if not to teach us to be kind and forgiving and loving, that even if the enemy wants to strike you at the cost of principles by which you and I need to stand, to represent the ultimate good, because we believe in Allah, who is the ultimate good template for us, then let it come and let us die for it. For that is what Islam is all about. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. You know what is one of the reasons why we lose faith? Amana. This verse that I recited in Surah An-Nisa, verse 58. In Allah ya amurukum an tu adul amanati ila ahliha. Allah commands you that you make over trusts to their owners, and that when you judge between people, you judge with justice and equity, not in an imbalanced way. Surely Allah admonishes you with what is excellent. Surely Allah is seeing, hearing, succinct to the point, but incredibly powerful. Give the trust. When you promise somebody, deliver it. We violate each other's trust too much. We promise we don't deliver. We say what we don't do. When Allah in the Quran says, لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ Why do you say that which you don't do? كَبْرَتْ مَقْدًا إِنْدَ اللَّهِ إِنْ تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ it is detestable to Allah that you say that which you don't do. Why? Allah says, because that's when you violate trust. We accuse each other of that. Let's stop accusing each other. Allah said, لا تلمزوا أنفسكم Don't find faults in each other under these guys. Let us be a role model. 
Let us encourage. Even if people are doing something wrong, don't poke fun at them. Don't look down upon them. Welcome them. Honor them. Give them the secondary option. Say, you're doing this, you're smoking, you're doing this. How about I show you something else? You know, when we say no to our children, I advise us all, don't ever say no without giving an alternative. Someone wants to do something, don't tell them, no, you cannot do this. Always say, I don't want you to do this, how about we do that? That latter sentence sits well in the mind of a human being. And they feel that, wow, you are guiding me, you are not prohibiting me. The problem we have is, no, 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 no. We don't give alternatives so people feel choked. And when they feel choked, then they rebel. Hijab is a thing. Same thing. We don't offer guidance. We shove it down their throats. People have a distaste for that. That's why Allah in the Quran says, like Rahafiddin, Qad tabayyana rushtu min al ghayb. There is no compulsion in religion. Truth is clear from error. So I advise us all, brothers and sisters, first and foremost, let's use our minds. When we get together, let's question the integrity. I sit here sometimes with my teenage brothers and sisters till late, till three, sometimes two in the morning, asking me questions about God, religion, Quran. How is this right? How is that true? How do you know Christianity, Judaism, Islam? Talk. I love it. They said, Hajj, four hours, five hours. I said, 48 hours, I'm not tired. Because that's food. That's dhikr. Wa dhikr Allah kathira. We don't need to go too deep into non-essential issues. But if it's going to strengthen your aqidah, it's going to strengthen your philosophy, your fundamental beliefs and purposes in life, then, I'm, then we need to teach each other to fish. Not throw fish at each other. But if we love it, we practice it. We put it into action. So let us spend more time. So use our aql, brothers and sisters. Use our tongues for good things. When we hear gossip, we should encourage those who gossip to stop. In other words, we discourage them from gossiping by changing the subject. Oh, by the way, did you know? Change the subject. Don't entertain it. Change it. I hear too much gossip. Allah said, لا يغتب بعضكم بعضا أيحب أحدكم أن يأكل لحم أخيه ميتا فكرهتم Do not find, do not backbite each other. It is like eating the flesh of your dead brother and it is detestable to you. Allah says, that's what you do when you backbite. The communities that we live in around the world is busy gossiping and backbiting and busy holding the other behind. In our communities, our progress levels are slow. Slow. We're moving at snail pace when it comes to progress. Our personal financial progress, mashallah. Mashallah. Some people really move fast. Three, four, five houses, cars, whatever. But coming to the community affairs where infrastructure for the future of our generations is to be built to secure the future generations on a moral front to understand the value of why we were created and to have discussions and institutions that talk valid lingo of the Quran and through role modeling? Is it a snail's pace? Why? Because we don't care. Or we don't know how. But here's even worse. When somebody does it, we work hard to stop them. We gossip. We find faults. We try to stop them. We mock them. We don't support them. No wonder the, programs, the progress doesn't take place because the human race is in the ditch and anybody who tries to get out, we pull them down. You're with me. You're going to stay with me because if you go up there, then you will look better than me. Allah says, Am yahsudun an nas ala ma Allah min fadl? Are you jealous of what we have given to some hmm? who have become ahead of you? Are you jealous? The Prophet said, Al Hasad fi jasad. Jealousy is like fire burning wood. And Allah said, La yahzun ka qawluhum inna al lillahi jamian. Don't let what they say bother you. If you believe in the truth, let them point fingers at you. Inna na'alamu ma yusirruna wa ma yu'alinun. Indeed, we know what is secret and what is known. Don't worry. On judgment day, Allah says, none of these people who make comments 
can stand in front of you, nor will they be asked. They will be held liable for their own deeds. Iqra' kitabaka kafa. Binafsik. Read this book that has been placed on your neck. Read it, for it is your deeds that you are being held liable for. So tonight, in all these nights, let's take charge of our own selves and say, I'm going to live a healthy life. I'm going to live a life of trust. And I'm going to live a life of that goal where I'm going to make sure that the skin God has given me, the heart God has given me, the lungs God has given me, and everything else, my eyes, my hair, my brain, I will protect it. It has haq, it has a right. And on judgment day, it will complain. Ya Allah, you created me for this being, but this being was constantly abusing me. Please, I advise us all, the religion of Islam is full of hope. And let's not use excuse that, oh, I'm stressed. That's why I need to go to de-stress. You want to de-stress? Go walk. Read the Quran. Read a book. Reading. Read a novel. Read philosophy. Read. They've done studies that when you read, the frontal lobe becomes hyperactive. Alpha waves start to work. And your brain gets sharper. You get more calm. You become more reflective. You become, you have greater erudition as one would say. You are sharper in your decision. And inshallah, wisdom increases because of that. Instead of going and poisoning our minds and ourselves, how about we go in this direction? So the reason there's a market out there, and the reason the, the, uh, the people are killing themselves, meaning suicide and depression, is on the rise? Believe me, no other reason. I have studied this long enough, coming from that background of social psychology, behavioral genetics. It's n no secret that that is the poison. But what has research shown? Research has shown, Harvard did a study, the longest study in history, 70 plus years, where they went to teenagers 70 years ago and asked them, what is your greatest desire? What do you wish? What do you want? What do you hope for the future? Classic answer, classic. If I asked any audience in the world, I'd get the same answer. Rich and famous. I want to be rich and I want to be famous. 70 years later, those who survived unanimously agreed they were dead wrong. See, rich and fame is just glitter. It's meaningless. People who are rich and famous, they've got the most depression. They're imbibing in so many drugs. If you listen to them, some of these K-pop singers are falling like flies and they're just in their 20s. They're falling like flies, but they're very talented. Why are they falling? Because as they're running, their fame is coming so fast, their wealth is coming so fast, they don't know what to do with it. They get so depressed, they commit suicide. They lose hope. You would think, my God, you're so talented. You're so good. Why? Because when there is no purpose in life, even if you achieve the moon and the sun in your hand, it's meaningless. It has no meaning. So research shows that unanimously those who survive said that building trust with humans is the most important thing. Having a relationship that's trustworthy and you die with the person you love and it's heart to heart talk in wealth or in poverty where there is social connection where you are dependent, codependent as a human race, it's the most fruitful thing. You will notice prophets in the Quran always say that. Yusuf alayhi salam says, Tawaffani Musliman walhiqni bis salihin. Let me die Muslim and make me among the good doers. Walhiqni bis salihin. Suleiman, a great king, riding his horse, and the insects are talking. Suleiman stops. He hears the ant telling the other ants, move, for Suleiman will crush us. Suleiman looks, he says, subhanallah, even the ants know who I am. That's how great Suleiman was. He looks up, he says, Rabbi, awzi'ni anashkura ni'mataka allati an'amta alayya wa ala walidayn. My Lord, invoke in me. Look how humble he is. He doesn't say, Thank you, God. Invoke in me. Make me grateful. He's already grateful. But what a dua. 
and ashkura ni'mataka allati an'amta alayya not pontificating on his horse like look how great i am how powerful i am look at these little creatures who are so scared of me and i can crush them no awzi'ni an ashkura ni'mataka allati an'amta alayhi wa ala walidayhi and my parents you know when i observe just this dua a great king on a horse with little insects under his feet and he looks up and he's asking god to invoke gratitude and remembers his parents as a king how many of us would do that wala walidai wa an a'mala salihan tarda make me do good deeds that makes you satisfied wa adkhilni bi rahmatika fi ibadika as-salihin and let me enter by your mercy among your good worshipers look at the social relationship in the quran continuously every prophet is begging for the same thing that ya allah put me among these good people in surah al-fajr you know there are three stages of the self nafs al-ammara nafs al-lawwama nafs al-mutma'inna three major stages when we reach the highest stage which is nafs al-mutma'inna which is the self that has taught itself and aligned itself perfectly the way god wants him to be as a true servant of god on this earth and your heart is tranquil and you've avoided all the haram and you choose all that's good and you are the soldier of god promoting good and forbidding evil ya ayatu nafs al-mutma'inna allah is addressing ya ayatu nafs al-mutma'inna ارجعي الى ربك راضية مرضية come back to your lord well pleased راضية مرضية listen to the next verse فادخلي في عبادي enter among the worshippers وادخلي جنتي enter paradise notice god doesn't say enter paradise enter among the worshipers now the true operative of the next existence in the next world will be to be among the social environment of the best of the best same on this earth allah says choose your friends wisely live with them imam ali alayhi salam says shame on you when you find a good friend and you lose him shame on you for it is not easy to find a good friend and when you lose a good friend you are a fool imam says keep it for that is one of the most powerful gifts of god that today research in universities is showing that the real impetus of the human race is to reach a stage where there is trust honesty dignity so you find rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam salawat ala muhammad wa ali muhammad People, somebody asked me, he says, you know, you are a Muslim, a Christian asked me this question. He says, you're a Muslim, you believe in Christ, Jesus, peace be upon him, a great man. But I would say that Jesus is better than your prophet. I said, why? He said, well, see, according to you, when Jesus was born, he declared his prophet at birth qala inni abdullah atani alkitaba wa ja'alani nabiyan wa ja'alani mubarakan ayna ma kunt he said i am a servant of god you know by the way the bible doesn't mention this it's an interesting thing it's an irony when people claim that the prophet plagiarized the quran the quran elegantly challenges that it says if the prophet plagiarized the quran make you plagiarize one too make another one since he can do it you do it and the arabs of the time were experts nobody could do it so that accusation is rubbish what is interesting is that the miracle of isa alayhi salam's birth is that he also was born without a father but he also spoke in the cradle when maryam says that i wish i wasn't alive for this for this pain is too much wahnan ala wahnin wa fisaluhu fi amaini the mother suffers pain upon pain for two years in weaning this child and ishkulli wa li walidayk allah says thank me and your parents for the pain that they went through to bring you maryam is giving birth to isa alayhi salam she says it's very painful fanada min tahtiha an la tahzani 
قَدْ جَعَلَ رَبُّكِ تَهْتَكِ سَرِيَّةِ The baby calls out from beneath her and says, Don't fret, for God has put a river under your foot. وَهُزِّ إِلَيْكِ بِجِزْعٍ نَخْلَةِ تُسَاقِتْ عَلَيْكِ رُطَبًا جَنِيَّةِ And shake this tree and take the ripe dates and cool yourself. Baby talking to its mother. No scripture talks about that except the Quran. The highest moral standards you teach a child that miracle of a child protecting his mother because when a woman delivers a child without a father it is impossible to prove that there was no father it is impossible socially there is absolutely no way to show that unless a miracle takes place yet you find biblically no such mention the first miracle of jesus salam, in the bible is when he's older he turns water into wine in the feast of canaan and he calls his mother woman what have you to do with me? Difference. So he says to me, Jesus declared his prophethood. But your prophet declared it later at the age of 40. Now let me get one point straight to all of us. All prophets, 124,000 of them, are all born prophets. They're not born non-prophets who become prophets later in time. No. Every prophet is already an appointee at birth. But some declare it early, some declare it later. So what is the wisdom of the holy prophet declaring it at the age of 40? So this Christian brother of mine, beautiful brother, loving, caring, it's a dialogue we're having. I said, you make a good point. It appears that way, that Jesus declared his prophethood at birth, and you would think it is better because the prophet declared it at the age of 40. I said, but let me tell you the wisdom of why the prophet didn't declare it at birth, for he was certainly a prophet. In fact, he was the prophet of all prophets. And every prophet preceding him, including Jesus, peace be upon him, had to recognize him even biblically. For Jesus says, verily, verily, there's much for me to say unto you, but ye shall not bear what I will tell you. But the paraclete who will come after me, the one, the comforter who shall come after me, he shall not speak of himself, but accept that which God tells him. Allah says, وَنَّجْمِ إِذَا هَوَى مَا ضَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا عَنِ الْحَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيُ يُحَى That Allah swears by the stars that this man that you call the prophet is not delirious, he is not astray, and he speaks nothing but that which God reveals to him. This is Rasulullah that even the Jews of Medina who were waiting for their Messiah in their scriptures knew that the person who's going to come and save humanity is going to show up in Medina. And when he showed up to their dismay, he wasn't directly from the Bani Israel and therefore they rejected him. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So the miracle of Isa salam, tremendous. He brought the dead back to life. He turned lepers into healthy people. He was the word of God. No question about it. Chosen, highest, ulul azam, never lied, never cheated. Even biblically when you read Jesus salam, he's loving, he's caring, he's forgiving, he's questioning the integrity of people, he's challenging the establishment. What a man of high degree, no question about it. But why the prophet at 40? There is hikmah in it, wisdom, for that is the foundation of religion which I'm speaking about tonight, as I promised you yesterday. It's the foundation of trust. The reason our children are going astray, the reason our community has lost faith, the reason our community stops to pray, the reason our community starts to question the existence of God, it's because we are violating each other's trust. We're shattering each other's trust. We're breaking bonds every minute through fault finding, giving incendiary comments, even parents who come and tell their children. I've seen children depressed. And they said, my dad calls me ugly. My mom says I'm ugly. I said, la hawla wa la quwata illa. Which mom tells you you're ugly? She says, my mom tells me I'm ugly. I said, maybe she's annoyed. Maybe she's tired. You're not ugly. Yeah, but my mom told me that. And my mom doesn't lie. So I am ugly. And then this child, you tell him to study. 
You give them hope, they doubt, they doubt, they doubt. Are you sure? Are you sure? And they do everything to make themselves beautiful. Trying everything, going online, you click here if you think I'm cute. Anything. I say to them, stop, stop. You're already beautiful. You're too beautiful. Stop. Start taking your beauty and grow with it, please. Don't let people stop you from what they say. But they need somebody to come in the way to give them that hope. There are children and adults who are, looking, who are on their way to commit suicide. And they met somebody who gave them hope. And then they wrote in their diaries, I was on my way to kill myself. But this person spoke to me, so I didn't. Tawasso bil haq. Tawasso bil sabr. Smile. Invite them. But it's building trust. Today, you find in, in other faiths, you find priests molesting children. I know people who become atheists because the very institution of God has violated their basic rights. See how shaitan works? He said, I will come in your own system and I will tear you all apart. And I will take you to hell with me. I will take you all. Except the chosen you know, agents of God. Only those. So I want to conclude on this. And then, inshallah, you and I will work on that. That, Ya Allah, I desire trust. Research shows the biggest problem we have on earth today is we are having very difficult time finding trustworthy people. Very difficult. But we must also look in the mirror and ask the question, how trustworthy am I? So that we don't point too many fingers at others. Let us be trustworthy. Now here's an interesting verse in the Quran. In Surah Al-Ahqaf, verse number 15. وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْ إِحْسَانًا حَمَلَةُ أُمُّهُ كُرْحًا وَوَوَضَتُ كُرْحًا وَحَمْلُهُ وَفِصَالُهُ ثَلَاثُونَ شَهْرًا حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ وَبَلَغَ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةً قَالَ رَبِّي أَوْزِعْنِي أَنْ أَشْكُرَ نِعْمَتَكَ Look, same what Suleyman said. Surah Al-Ahqaf. نعمتك التي نعمت علي وعلى والدي وأن عمل صالحا ترضى وأصلح لي في ذريتي إني تبت إليك وإني من المسلمين. And we have enjoined on man doing good to parents. What a beautiful verse. Enjoined upon mankind, a religion that's beautifully laid out. All of mankind should be good to their parents. What a solution. Come back to your roots. Honor them. Trust them. First root, rule of law. You want security? Don't give up the tree that gave birth to you. He says, and did his mother bear him? And with trouble did she bring him forth? And the bearing of him and the weaning of him was 30 months until when he attains his maturity and reaches 40 years. He says, my Lord, grant me that I may give Grant me that I may give thanks for your favor which you have bestowed on me and on my parents. And that I may do good which pleases you and do good to me in respect of my offspring. This one, not only parents, but offspring. Surely I turn to you and surely I am of those who submit. Final point here. You will notice that 40 is an interesting number. Quran is addressing the age 40. Prior to the age of 40, you become baligh as a male between 13 and 15 years of age, sisters around 9. Between 9 and 40 is all God allowing you to bounce around. Make mistakes, slip, find it. Start early. Start at birth. But by 40, if you haven't got it, then it's going to get harder. There is something about the age of 40 that just settles you down. Life takes a unique turn. Marriage has taken place, so the me has become a we, the M flipped. Children came, the I got distributed to more. All those little escapades and little joys that we had for our childish, selfish runs suddenly become secondary, because now you have to worry about the outcome of the family. There is maturity. Rasulullah, at the age of 40, declared his prophethood. So I was telling this Christian brother of mine, I said the religion of God is built on the foundation of trust. 
For the prophet could have easily performed a miracle at birth, but miracles die in time. For if you and I witness Lazarus being brought to life when he died, you and I, if we witnessed, our faith will be at its maximum level. But our great-grandchildren will be questioning the integrity of what we saw. Because miracles die in time. But the miracle of trust, the miracle of wisdom, the miracle of intellect continues to grow. That is why the greatest miracle of the Prophet is the Quran, which doesn't die in time, it grows in time. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. So you find when the prophet came and I said to my friend, I said, the prophet was standing on the foundation of miracles and I'll tell you how he did it. For when Allah says, Ya yuhal muddathir, umdur, or you wrapped one, go warn the people that you are now the prophet of their people, of the people. You were silent for 40 years. When he came to Mecca to the people, he was in Mecca, he tells the people, come. He stands on a mountain called Abu Qubais. Today there is a palace up there. He says, if I tell you people, and remember, who are these people? Idol worshippers, pagans, don't believe in God as one, believe in statues. Their statues were made even of dates and wood and stone. He says, if I tell you that there is a caravan behind this mountain, will you believe me? He said, Anta Sadiqul Ameen. You're honest. You're trustworthy. He said, then I say to you, there is no God but Allah, and I am his messenger. SubhanAllah. It was, a, it was such a profound statement. People were stunned. What? We are idol worshippers. We have 360 gods in the Kaaba. Our economy is dependent on that. He says, I'm telling you. You know why? But when he stood there, he said, 40 years, did you guys see me lie, cheat? But he needed to be silent to prove that point. For if he declared his prophethood early, then people would be questioning that maybe it's all an act. But see, he was silent. So the validity of a human being's prophethood is standing on the foundation of trust. You and I, brothers and sisters, are endowed with the finest models on earth. Finest representatives. When Allah said, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا You have the best role model. One who's built on trust, who never violated a single trust. That even when they wanted to kill him, and he did hijrah from Mecca to Medina, and people were giving him wealth to store in his house, he appoints it to Imam Ali alayhi salam and says, you will sleep on my bed, and before you come to Medina, you will distribute this wealth that was given to me as amana by the very people who are my enemies. Allah says, we enjoin upon you to return the trust of mankind, and when you judge, you judge with dignity and equity. This is the religion of Islam, which you and I need to follow. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. Karbala is all about trust. When they wrote letters to Imam Hussein, come to Kufa, we are with you. Imam says, I have an obligation. People are calling me. People are beginning to realize their duty. They have ignored the duty. That when Allah commanded them, Ya yu alladhina amanu, ati'u Allah wa ati'u rasul wa ulil amri minkum. Or you believe, obey Allah and obey the messenger and those vested with authority from among you. We forgot the third group. And a caliph comes, Yazid ibn Muawiyah ibn Abu Sufyan, a tyrant. In three years, he desecrated the most sacred institutions of Islam, desecrated, killed the grandson of the Prophet, basically killed the Prophet. He desecrated, he burnt the Kaaba, and he desecrated the Prophet's house in the mosque. Which caliph, in which religion do you know, was capable of doing that in three years? Yazid did it. So people wrote letters to him, come, you are our imam. He said, I'm sending my representative first to establish and to validate and to prepare for my coming. So Muslim ibn Aqil goes to Kufa first and in a heartbeat, people abandon him. I remember this every day, sisters and brothers, every single day. That when my Imam comes, God forbid I abandon him. God forbid. Hmm? 
The Prophet says, Afdalul ibadah intadar al Mahdi. One of the best forms of ibadah is the intadar of your leader. Hold on to him, for that's your guiding connection to God. For that's where dignity lies, that's where trust lies, that's where honesty lies. Guidance and leadership that Imam Hussain was so careful in his movements, so careful. Every stop he made out of the 14 stops until the 14th one was Karbala, he would talk to the people, invite them, warn them, tell them, even Arafah. Before Imam leaves, he tells them, I'm warning you, this is what you need to do. Allah says, warn them, do the da'wah, bring them closer, tell them the truth. Even on the day of Ashura, Imam would keep going forward and talk to them. He would constantly talk to them. Many of the companions who fought with Imam Hussain would go forward and talk to the enemy and said, wait, you're doing a mistake. Stop, stop. But they didn't listen. This is how Imam was. Such leadership. Trust. So he goes. He's been entrusted. And many a times, in fact, in Medina, when he was cornered by the governor to give bay'ah, and he says, I want bay'ah now. You give me bay'ah right now. Imam says, are you threatening me? He says, we will kill you. Imam holds the hilt of his sword. He said, we have made a promise to God to give ourselves to him. We're not afraid. Do not threaten me. Imam Ali alayhi salam was like that. Imam Hassan was like that. Every Imam was like that. Unafraid. Bold. So he said, we're not afraid. I ask myself, Ya ibn Rasulillah, what is it that gives you such security? Allah says, wa tawakkal ala Allah, wa kafa billahi wakila. Do tawakkal. I will save you. Even if your death comes, trust. Tonight, we commemorate the son of Imam Hassan and the two sons of Zainab Aun and Muhammad. And Imam Hassan's son was known as Qasim ibn al Hassan. These were young boys. Let me establish something important. In Karbala, Imam selected who will represent him. He made sure not a single companion who represented Karbala would turn their face away from the truth. For it would taint the message of Karbala, the sacrifice for human generations to come. So you will read every companion who fought, old and young, never wavered. And I think that's trust. Build trust. Go forward. Don't ever run away from the battlefield. When you make a promise, deliver, even if it means you die. So you find Imam is standing there. He was so meticulous. Let me give you one quick point. When he was digging a moat behind the tent for the women, as he's digging, Shemr al Joshan comes on his horse. And Imam now is putting wood to prevent the enemy from attacking the women's tents from the back. Because Imam is concerned about the women. The women are there. And if you ask the Imam, you will see his greatest concern was the women he's leaving behind. Even Imam Zain al-Abidin who was present in Karbala, even Imam Muhammad Baqir our fifth Imam was present in Karbala, you find their fear, the greatest fear was their women. What will happen to their women? So Imam is digging and he's putting these pieces of wood and lighting a fire. Shimmer says, oh, you're preparing yourself for hell. Taunting. Muslim ibn Awsajah was present, the old companion who was Hafiz of Quran, was furious. He looks at Shimr and says, you will be the first one to burn in hell. And Muslim has his hand on the hilt of his sword and is ready to take it out to strike Shimr. Imam looks at him, puts his hand on his sword and tells him, don't. Muslim, don't. Be calm. Be patient. For he wants you to do this. For if you get annoyed, they will use this against us. Look how careful the Imam was to ensure that nobody moved away from the message of Karbala. You and I are its beneficiaries today for that perfection. You and I must live and die for this cause. So Imam Hussain on the day of Ashura, all the companions have died. Now in Karbala, every age was represented from an infant to the oldest, from male to female. Every representative was there, from the white to the yellow to the brown to the black. Every group was there. 
from all groups and cultures, they joined in, elite groups. And of course, the youngest was Imam Hussein's son, Abdullah. So while the Imam is standing, he sees all the companions have died. And why the companions died first? In every battle, the Prophet and his family, the Banu Hashim, would be the first to defend, and then the companions would join. In Karbala, it was reversed. Imam told the companions to go first, and he went last, because this one was a massacre. So the companions have been killed. Habib ibn Madahid is gone. Muslim ibn Awsaj is gone. All the companions have died. Their bodies are strewn on the fields. While the Imam is standing, a young boy, 13 years old, is pulling on his abba. He says, Ammo, uncle. Imam looks at him. He says, give me permission to go and fight. He carries him, 13 year old. He said, you are the amana my brother left you with. You are the gift my brother left you with me after he became shaykh. That how can I give you this permission to go? He says, allow me to go. Qasim ibn al-Hasad, 13 years old. <laughs> Imam looks at him. He says, I can't let you go. You're in Amana. He says, my father has given you a note that there will come a day when you will need this protection. And Imam Hassan says to him, I will not be there for our mother and father and grandfather has told us about this day. But my son will represent you. So Imam says, I can't refuse you, O Qasim. If my brother's wish was that, if your mother has allowed you to go farwa, then I cannot say no. Reluctantly, Imam puts him on a horse. Historians say that he wasn't a soldier. He was wearing sandals. And his sandal strap actually was hanging because it wasn't tied. And as he's riding away on his horse, Imam said this, that strap was dragging on the sand. He said, I witnessed that. This is good. One of his titles, this little boy was Qamar Bani Hashim, the moon of Bani Hashim. So he goes forward. And Qasim was valiant. He says, Ana Qasim ibn al Hassan ibn Ali. A little 13 year old boy swinging his sword with pride. He won't last long. Some historians say he struck a few. He was shuja. Then soon he was struck. And he falls and he calls his uncle. And Imam Hussain alayhi salam goes towards him. And I can just imagine that scenery. It's quick, but it's so rich and deep. It's so deep that a young boy ready to sacrifice for truth. We must teach our children in this world to sacrifice for truth, even if it means on a battlefield, but day to day, firm indeed. Aun and Muhammad, the two sons of Zainab, you know, they both went to Karbala with her. And Zainab salam, greets them goodbye. They come and seek permission from their uncle again. But he says, go to your mother, the sister of Imam Hussain. And she says, how reluctant I would have to be, but as a mother, I cannot say anything but for this great sacrifice, my two sons, make me proud, O oh, and Muhammad. They say these two brothers also ascended on the horse. And Zainab kissed them goodbye. Which mother, I say in the annals of history, which mother can give up her two beautiful sons and watch them as they alight on as they get on a horse? And as they're riding, and she's standing there, making dua, Rabbana taqabbal haq. My Lord, accept this sacrifice. Anand and Muhammad were also killed, but before they were killed, they were valiant. They were talking to each other, spinning their horses, coming forward to the enemy. Historians say they killed a few. The numbers we don't exactly know, but we know that they fought. I don't need to get into the goriness of it. But every one of them, their head was severed from the body.
السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنار ولا جعل الله آخر الأهل مني لزيارتك السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين خصوصا سيدي ومولاه يا أبا الفضل العباس وأختك زينب وبنتك رقية جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته عزم الله أجورنا وأجوركم إن شاء الله may Allah reward us all for this grief in remembering this great tragedy and may we live and die with trust, honesty, dignity and courage inshallah we're going to have Latmiyat recited join us please it doesn't take long. Give it a little respect. Some of us may ask, what is this for? Recognition in concert, all of us, realizing, recognizing that event brings higher spirits. And activities like jama'ah, prayers, and so on, hajj, all incre increases our spirits. Join us, inshallah. Salawatullah Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.